Okie doke, folks. We're in. Now, surveillance. What is workers' compensation surveillance and who conducts it? Workers' compensation surveillance generally is conducted by the insurance companies, and they are trying to catch you being bad. Um, we all know, for the most part, what surveillance entails and what they're looking for. They're looking to catch you uh, misrepresenting yourself. So if you go to your doctor and you tell them that you can't do anything and you're totally disabled and you can barely walk one block and you can't uh, you can't lift more than five pounds and you're in agonizing, excruciating pain. And if you tell us to the insurance company doctor, or if you tell it to the judge in court or the insurance company when they're questioning you in front of the judge, um, they want to catch you being less than truthful. They want to catch you uh, misrepresenting yourself. So if you tell your, your doctor or the insurance company doctor that you can't walk more than a city block and they catch you walking four blocks or five blocks or 10 miles a day, they're going to use that against you. If you tell them you can't sit for more than five minutes without being in pain and having to get up and change position and they catch you driving a car for a half an hour, they're going to try to use that against you. So insurance companies spend a lot of money on surveillance because they're trying to catch you because the money that they spend on surveillance, if they're able to prove that you're being less than truthful, if they catch you in a, uh, in a lie that's going to be used against you, then they don't have to pay you anymore, most likely. Um, we've discussed insurance fraud in the past and um, the penalties that come with fraud. If you are caught uh, being fraudulent, workers' compensation fraud, there are two penalties that can attach. Uh, there's actually three. The first one is if you're caught committing fraud, uh, you could be prosecuted criminally. You could be referred to the district attorney. You could be arrested. You could be prosecuted as a criminal. When fraud is raised, you have to speak to a criminal attorney. You have to watch what you say at that point. We don't want you going to jail. Um, the other penalties that can attach to a fraud finding, there are there are mandatory and there are discretionary penalties. The mandatory penalties are the benefits that you receive that are directly attributable to the fraudulent behavior are forfeited, and a judge can find discretionary penalties, which mo more often than not is a complete forfeiture of all of your indemnity, your money benefits. So usually that's what happens. I have had cases where a judge will find a mandatory penalty disqualifying somebody from benefits for a period of time and then a discretionary penalty where it might be another six months of workers comp awards but generally speaking if they're finding fraud they're finding fraud and you're going down and all your benefits are going to be lost so um we've we've discussed that before i will post a link um to the fraud videos at some point um but we have done fraud videos let me just adjust this camera a little bit I want my loyal fans to get my good side. Um, so yeah, fraud is huge. Uh, legal nurse, Dieguez, I prepare the clients and I am a DME nurse observer. I am present with the client during the exam. Okay, well, we're gonna we're gonna chat. Um, every side is my good side. Uh, another loyal follower there, uh, Mr. Cooper, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, you you're making me blush. So, uh, Ms. Diego, yeah, we'll talk about um, the IMEs. I'm assuming that you're talking about IMEs and uh, how important it is for the clients to be honest at the IME examinations. And an IME, for those of you who don't know, is an independent medical examination. And it is far from independent. It's an exam set up by the insurance company for you to see a doctor of their choosing so they can get their own opinion on whatever the question might be. And it could be what body parts you hurt, how bad your injuries are, what's your diagnosis, do you need surgery, whatever medical questions could pop up. So we're going to get into that uh, in just a moment. Sorry, I need to take a beverage. Um, so yeah, insurance company is conducted. It's paid for by the insurance company. It's conducted by uh, investigators. And generally speaking, the investigators, as much as people, my clients will come in, the ones that are, are having this issue, and they'll say, oh, I know I'm being followed. For every one of you that knows you're being followed, there's 10 of you that don't realize you're being followed. Why? Because the investigators, the private investigators who do this are not idiots. Most of them are uh, law enforcement, former law enforcement, retired cops. Uh, they know what they're doing. They know um, even when they're not specifically following you and surveilling you with video, they know what they're doing. They know how to get information that they is, is beneficial to their cause um, and they're not idiots. So again, for every one of you that says, ah, I know there's a 
uh, a, a brown Buick parked up the street that's only been there for a week. I know who that is. There's probably 10 of you that don't realize what's going on. So please uh, be mindful of that because it's it's surveillance is happening more and more. Um, insurance companies are being successful with it. And with every success that they get, they're doing it more and more to try to limit their exposure. And that's all it comes down to. You know, people take it personally, and I certainly would take it personally if it was being done to me. Um, insurance companies don't really care. They don't care who you are. They don't care about you and your family. They don't. It's 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 exposure, and it's it's a monetary thing. They want to keep from spending money. They want to save as much money as possible. They're a business like any other business, and the way they stay in business is by making money. And making money includes not spending it and not giving it out if they can keep from doing that. So. Um, that's what happens here. Here's a good question. What if an insurance company does fraud? Well, it's very tough to prove. We have had it. Um, we have shown in the past with certain very select cases um, where an insurance company or an employer, it's usually more the employer than the insurance company, uh, has done something that's been uh, fraudulent. And it does happen. Uh, it's very, very rare, unfortunately. Uh, insurance companies, you know, they do have a lot of money. And a lot of that money goes to their legal counsel. Um, they have in-house lawyers. They have outside lawyers that they hire on particular cases. They have more lawyers than you could imagine. So they make sure every step that they take um, for the most part is legal. So it's very rare that you run into a carrier committing fraud, but it does happen. It does happen with more likely it's it's the employer committing fraud um, because they're not as uh, legally savvy as the insurance companies uh, and they'll do stupid things and we'll catch them in fraud. Um, you should with reporting certain information, but it does happen. So good question, Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to chime in at any point in time. Moving on. How often do insurance companies use surveillance and which types of comp cases tend to have it assigned? So, um, like I said before, um, generally, uh, Instances of surveillance and the fraud allegations that come with it are happening more and more. And certain insurance companies use it more than others in certain circumstances, certain employers. Um, I don't want to say request. It happens in, in certain circumstances more than others. There's trends. Um, but that being said, uh, on the whole, I see that it's it's a growing practice because to be completely honest, it's been useful for insurance companies. They're they're using it to their advantage to harm people. They're catching people, and what might be a relatively innocent white lie could result in you losing all your benefits. So that's why we're seeing more and more of it. Um, and you want to know what type of cases tend to have it inside. Generally and traditionally, it was cases. It was the, the cases with higher exposure, more risk, more downside for the insurance company more money at stake it was the big money cases where you saw it traditionally and still generally true but it really can be any case anybody's subject to it it can happen at any point in time and i've seen it on relatively medium small cases because the insurance company really they're just trying to not only are they trying to save the money on that particular case but oftentimes they're trying to make an example so what they'll do is they'll try to hit somebody and catch them on surveillance and know that that will send some shockwaves through their community, through their work community, their home community. And it it sets the fear of God into people so they know not to mess around with the insurance company. So uh, honestly, it's, it's popping up more and more. Um, and people need to be aware of it. Okay. So... How do private investigators spy on injured workers and what are some of their most common methods? So, you know, we know the everyday common methods, tailing, you know, they, they'll follow you in your car. When you get in your car to go someplace, they'll follow you. And we generally and traditionally, we see them, they'll sit outside your house and they'll show on their video recording your house and the house number and the street that when they're coming up the block so they could prove to everybody that they're at your house. And sometimes they'll show a picture of the ID that they got somehow usually it's through the doctor's office and then they'll they'll wait there and sometimes they'll wait there for hours and even days and even weeks for you to make an appearance and when you come out of your house boom they put the camera on you and they zoom all the way in and they show that it's you uh and then they follow you and a lot of times these surveillance videos will show you doing a whole lot of nothing but then they might catch you dumping the garbage 
then they might catch you shoveling the snow. They might catch you um, unloading groceries in and out of the trunk of your car, carrying groceries, sitting in your car for a period of time, carrying your children, uh, picking up toys, doing yard work or housework. We've seen all of these things happen. Um, so, uh, and the tailing aspect of it, um, a lot of times they'll, if they can't get you at home, they'll catch you someplace where they know you're going to be. And where do they know you're going to be? Your doctor's office or the insurance company's doctor. They might not know your exact schedule for when you see your doctor or your therapist, but they do know from the insurance company when you are scheduled to see the insurance company doctor. And that is a very ripe time for them to surveil you for a lot of reasons. They know you're going to be there. They know you're, you're going to be taking transportation there. And the method of transportation is usually a very big factor in determining a person's um, disability and truthfulness. You know, they'll ask your doctor, how long can so-and-so sit? And they'll say, oh, he can't sit for more than five minutes. And then they'll have you on video uh, driving 20 minutes to your IME appointment. And that shows that there's some, um, some issue there with truthfulness. Or they'll say, uh, you know, my patient can't take the bus or the subway. He can't manage the stairs. And then they'll have the video of you coming off the subway. So that's, uh, you know, that, that that is one circumstance where they will tell you. Also, a lot of times they will have, once they tell you to the IME appointment, where you now go in and you talk to the insurance company doctor and you say, I use this cane every day and I can't walk around without it. And I use my neck collar and I use my elbow brace and I use my back brace. And I use all this equipment and I walk with a heavy limp and I can't lift anything. And they'll catch, they'll catch you. They'll record you. They'll report what you're doing at the time of the IME, the exam with the insurance company doctor. And the doctor will write all that down. And once you leave that doctor's office, they're going to continue to follow you. And we've had people go to their car and drive up the street and take their back brace off and do a hop and a skip and a jump and walk into the supermarket and walk out with arms full of groceries. And clearly at that point, I'm sorry, sir, but it doesn't look good that five minutes ago you couldn't walk uh, without a limp or a cane, and now you're, you're skipping down the street. Um, so insurance companies will uh, send um, investigators, and a lot of times they'll, they'll tail you to and from the doctor's office. That's a, that's a big one. Uh, other things they do is they'll track your social media. They'll go on your Facebook and your Instagram and whatever, and they'll see if you're doing any activities or weekend fun um, doing things that you shouldn't be doing. Um, so if you're, you know, claiming to be hundred percent disabled, skydiving might not be the best thing for you to do. Um, you know, riding your dune buggy might not be so smart riding your dirt bike. So please be mindful. Um, and don't do things that you shouldn't be doing. Uh, so social media is, is a, is a big one. They'll track your social media. Another thing they do is they speak with your family, friends, and neighbors. They will knock on your neighbor's door and they'll say, Hey, what's up with so-and-so? Uh, have you seen them? You know, they'll ask simple questions and, and even the smallest bit of information can be harmful. So they will do things like that. Um, they, they can also do very creative things. I'm, I'm seeing some questions chiming in here. I will get to them in one moment. Um, we had a gentleman one day who was living in an apartment building that was owned by his wife. And this is a true story. It happened with one of my clients. Lived in a multifamily apartment building that his wife and his wife's family owned. She was at work. He was home with a back injury. And there was a for rent sign in the window. One of the apartments was vacant and it was for rent. And the investigator knocked on the door. And my client answered the door and said, can I help you? He says, I want to go see the apartment that's for rent. He said, I can't. Um, I'm, I'm, it's my wife's building. When she gets home, she'll show you. He said, no, 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 I want to see it now. And my client climbed the flight of stairs with him and opened the door and let him in. He said, when you're done, please lock up. And what do you know? They raised fraud. They said, oh, he says he's 100% disabled and he can't work. And his doctor said he can't work and he's not doing any work. But here he is showing apartments. And that was an argument that we needed to deal with. And unfortunately, uh, it was a big problem. So you know, they get creative and they do things that are tricky and they try to trap you and it's, uh, they don't always play fair. And that was a very dirty trick they played and it, it created a lot of, a lot of, uh, headache, uh, for me and my client. Uh, let's take a look here. Jose is asking if they deny your claim in general, could they still have people investigating you? If your case is still pending. Okay. It's a very good question. Jose is on the ball today. We, Jose is getting the gold star so far. Um, if your case is pending, if they're litigating your case, if you're actively involved in trying to prove your case and they're trying to disprove and you're going to court and you're in the middle of that litigation process, 
Yes, they could still have people investigating you. They could still have people um, following you. Technically, there's if if it, if an investigator follows the rules and the law, they can investigate you anytime they want because the information they're getting is information that would otherwise be accessible to the general public. So they're not, you know, looking in your window. They're not they're not breaking into your house. Um, they're just following you in public for the most part. Um, so technically, they could investigate you anytime they want. I mean, theoretically, an insurance company wouldn't. I can't imagine that they would do this, but there's nothing to prevent them from investigating you after your case is completely settled and going back and proving that this guy was a big fraud and a liar. We want our money back. Um, they know that they would have a tough time doing that. It's a very difficult case. They settle cases for reason to cut their losses, so that probably would not happen. But could it happen? Absolutely. So very good question. Um, they are they, they, You're always at risk for, for surveillance, Jose, to answer your question briefly. Uh, David Gonzalez wants to know, can I get paid for reporting a fraud? Uh, you're asking about whistleblower laws. I don't know the answer to that question. That's a great question. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, tsunami. Nice car. My IME gave me 5% impairment, but before I had 41. Is the 5% the final result? Can my lawyer fight that? All right, that's an IME question. That's a, a disability question. Your lawyer can always fight it, especially if it's the IME. Um, you should show your, your, again, we're getting off topic here, and I apologize. Show your, your IME report to your doctor and your lawyer um, and, and ask your lawyer what they can do to fight that. So, yes. But moving back on to investigations and surveillance, folks. Um, So legal nurse Diego is, is, is chiming in on Instagram. Um, she's familiar with this, this process. And she says, the surveillance are aware of the day of the IME appointment and may follow the client to know if they are not honest. That's exactly my point. They know the day and the time of the IME. They know the address of the IME. The insurance company gives them all that information. And they will either sit outside your house and follow you there. They'll sit outside the IME doctor's office and watch you walk in and out. They will then follow you after you leave and see how you get out. And then they'll follow you for the rest of the day to see what you're doing afterwards. Um, and they will try to use that information to show that you were not being honest at the IME, that you needed a cane to walk in and out of the IME doctor's office, but you didn't need a cane the whole rest of the day. So that's a very big one. Um, legal nurse Diego is very nice. Thank you. Okay. So, yes, the room for entering up the IME. So that's how they investigate. We're going to move on to the next slide here. What legal limitations do private investigators have when conducting surveillance? What can't they do? So they have to follow the law. They can't trespass. They can't do things illegally. Um, but generally, if it's within the bounds of the law, if they're out in public, if it's something that somebody could, if it's information or observation that somebody could get while being in public, that's generally what they're doing. They're, they're, they're exercising at the limits of the law. Um, but they're not doing anything that a random person who decided to follow you around couldn't otherwise get. So um, if you feel like you're being followed, if you feel like something, if you're uncomfortable, if there, I've had clients say that there's a creepy guy following them around. I don't know that it's a surveillance uh, or, or an investigator. If you feel uncomfortable, call the police. Um, if, you, if there's a problem going on, if somebody's tailing you and you don't know if it's surveillance, Call the police. If somebody's knocking on your door and you don't know who they are and you don't want to answer and you're scared, call the police. Um, they cannot trespass. They can come knock on your door like any other citizen or or anybody out in public. They can come knock on your door, um, but they cannot. Uh, they can't trespass. If you feel uncomfortable, call the police. Okay. Just seeing some other questions. Uh, let me see if anybody here. Okay, so moving on. What are private investigators looking for? Excuse me. What are private investigators looking for when spying on injured workers? Uh, they're looking for big things like fraud or little things too. They're looking for, for both big things and little things. Listen, if they can get the smoking gun and nail you in the act of, uh, you know, working when you're saying you're not working or lifting bags of concrete to, to, to you know, to build a pool in your own backyard, um, you know, those big things are, 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 are 
they are looking for that, but they're also looking for the little things. Um, if you tell your doctor, the insurance company doctor, that you can't sit for more than five minutes and you're driving for 10 minutes, they're going to use that against you. Something as minor and as stupid as that. If you say that you can't lift more than five pounds and you're lifting up your 30 pound child, they're going to use that against you as horrible as that is. Um, you know, they don't know how much pain you're in, but the things like even the little things like that, they're going to use against you. I've said in other videos, if you're helping your elderly neighbor by, by sho shoveling snow, they're going to use that against you if you say you can't do that. So you need to be careful. You need to be smart. Um, they are looking for anything to show that you're misrepresenting your condition to uh, whether it's your doctor, the insurance company doctor or the judge. So when you're in court and the judge is asking you questions or the insurance company is asking you questions, they're looking to catch you in a lie as small as that lie might be. They want to call your credibility into question and try to hammer you with that. And it's horrible, but it's something that's very real and we need to be aware of it and we need to deal with it. How long does surveillance typically last? When can injured workers rest assured that they're not being watched? Well, Surveillance could last days, weeks, months, uh, could last years, presumably, if, if the case is going to go that long. Um, usually, if they're going to if they're going to surveil you, they're going to tail you, they're going to follow you. It's usually a couple days at least. Um, and I've seen it go. You know, they'll do a few days over a few weeks. Sometimes they'll they'll go months because they're trying to pattern you. You know, they know that on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday you go to physical therapy at ten o'clock in the morning. And sometimes it takes them a few weeks to learn that pattern. They know that you see your, your orthopedist at the third Thursday of every month at two o'clock. They want to learn that pattern and they want to, they want to track you. They also want to pattern your, 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 I guess, normal everyday behavior. You go to breakfast with your friends. You know, we had a guy, an older guy who used to meet all of his friends at the coffee shop every Tuesday and Thursday morning. They want to, they want to learn those patterns and track those patterns. Um, again, the, the investigators that do this stuff are not idiots. They are usually retired law enforcement or some level of law enforcement. And even when they're not, they're not idiots. They're trained. They know what they're doing. And um, patterning you is something that they do. This way they can follow you on a, on a regular basis, get you on video on a regular basis, and do their best to show that you are misrepresenting your condition, your work-related injuries. So be, be mindful of all that. Um, when can injured workers rest assured that they're not being watched? Usually it's at the end of the case, when the case settles, when the case is otherwise completely finalized. If you go back to work at full duty and not much else has happened, generally at that point you're relatively safe. But like I said earlier, it could come up at any point in time. And a lot of times they're using it to make an example of, of, of that person for a lot of other people. It's, it's, as, it's just as important to them to save that money in that case, probably more important to make an example of that person for all the other people out there so they know um, that they should not be falsifying or misrepresenting themselves. At least this is the, the point they're trying to make because um, it's going to save them money in the long term. So that's, the, that's their big purpose here. What can injured workers do to avoid being caught by surveillance? Sorry. Um, what should you do if they get evidence against you? So the biggest thing, and you know, this has been the theme in many of my my videos and live streams. You 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 don't want to misrepresent yourself. You want to be upfront. You want to be honest. Uh, we've gone over all this before. If you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to hide. So if you tell your doctors and you tell the insurance company's doctors and you don't misrepresent yourself. Um, you, you, you don't have anything to worry about. So, you know, hey, doc, I have trouble lifting heavy things, but, you know, I still dump the garbage from time to time. I do the best I can. If I have to shovel the snow, I shovel the snow. If you're if you're honest with them, um, you don't you have nothing to worry about. If you go and you tell them, oh, I'm in the worst pain ever and I can't do anything. Well, then they're going to be looking to, to nail you. So just be honest. Don't don't over embellish your 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 pain, your disability, your injuries. Just be honest. It, it's it's so much easier that way. And if if you're upfront and you're honest and they, they have nothing to look for, they're not going to send surveillance after you because what are they going to catch you doing? Exactly what you told them that you do anyway. It's it, it's pointless. Um, make sure you tell not only your doctor but the insurance company doctor. Many people kind of feel like, well, you know, my doctor knows me well enough to know what I'm capable of, so you know, I don't have to mention it to him. And other people think also, I don't have to tell the insurance company. Let them figure it out on their own. 
Um, so I'm, I'm not going to give them all the information. It's going to get used against you. And the same holds true when you're in court and the judge asks you, what, have you been working? Have you done anything? Always be upfront. Um, you know, I always tell people, if you're serving soup in a soup kitchen uh, for free and you're, you're volunteering, somebody's going to accuse you of working. So just tell them, tell the judge, hey, I haven't done any work. I haven't made any money. Uh, every Sunday I go down to my church and I help ser serve homeless people food. Uh, it makes me feel better and gets my mind off my injuries. At least you're upfront and honest about it. And you, you're not going to you're going to stay out of trouble. Um, if you feel like you're under surveillance, if you feel like somebody's following you, if you feel like somebody's recording you, if you keep seeing a weird car up the block from your house, um, and yet you're, you're, you're suspicious, call your lawyer, talk to your lawyer and that, and you really need to lay your cards on the table at that point and talk about what you, uh, what, what you're experiencing, your injuries, your disabilities, you should go through your IME reports with your lawyer. Um, that's a big one um, and talk to them about your concerns you want to get out in front of a of a fraud and surveillance issue you don't want it to blindside you and hit you and that's what they they aim to do when they walk into court they disclose that the uh, judge we have surveillance we want to ask the claimant some questions the judge says okay and they say sir uh and they ask you a whole bunch of questions that are specifically pointed at what they're looking to get sir uh you told the insurance company doctor that you're only capable of walking uh one city block is that true Oh, yeah, I think I told him that. Is that how much can you walk? Oh, maybe a block, maybe two blocks. Okay, judge, we have video showing something different. And then they show a video of you walking a half a mile. So uh, if you feel like that's, that surveillance is, is, is there, if you feel like somebody's on you, you want to, you want to talk to your lawyer about that. Seeing some questions pop up here. Can they send you to take a drug test and alcohol test after three months of the accident happened? I don't know about the, the time frame. I know there's a lot of um, union requirements there. If a person has an accident, certain unions have, have uh, in their collective bargaining agreements where you have to go and take a, uh, sorry, my, uh, my news feed just popped up and blocked me, where you have to go take a drug or an alcohol test. Um, there are circumstances um, where drug and alcohol tests are required following an accident there's also circumstances where drug testing is required if you're being prescribed narcotic pain medications uh, a lot of doctors want to make sure that you're taking your medication so drug testing is um, a small component here i don't know the specific time frame there i'll we have to look that up but that's a good question thank you uh huma i'm receiving an award for my service in government Congratulations. Can I go to receive that award even if I just go to 15 minutes? I said, Huma, I don't know you and I don't know your case. Huma wants to know how long she could sit, how long I recommend she sit for. So um, I don't, I can't answer your question. You should speak to your lawyer and you should speak to your doctor. Congratulations on your award. That's something to be very proud of. Um, well done. Well done. Sequoia, can I make a restriction order of the investigator? You are asking to uh an order of protection i don't know the answer to that question uh, i don't think so because you're not in, you're not, probably not an imminent harm so you probably cannot get a restraining order against the private investigators just be smart be mindful of their presence if you have a significant team smoke shack outdoors it sounds like barbecue i'm hungry now if you have a significant significant injuries and diagnose ptsd will they do surveillance um, they will do, that's a good question. They will do surveillance on people with uh, psychological injuries as well as physical injuries. So it could come up either way. It's a little harder to show you acting um, or misrepresenting yourself with a psychological injury. So it's less frequent, uh, significantly less frequent, but it still does happen. So um, you can be subject to surveillance and a fraud allegation, even if it's a psychological injury like PTSD or a psychiatric condition. So very good question. Very good. Um, any pro tips for dealing with workers' comp surveillance? Anything that anybody should know? Uh, it's like I said before, be upfront, be honest. Do not uh, embellish. Do not overdo it when you're talking to the doctors or the judge about your condition. Um, it, it, it's not going to help you. The, 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 any convincing that your embellishment does is going to be far uh, negated by by a fraud allegation so it's just not worth it plus the medical 
says what your condition is. Your medical records and your doctor's records show exactly what you're capable of. Um, so by you over embellishing there, it doesn't it doesn't help you at all. It makes you look worse. So you need to be very very careful. Just be smart. Just be smart. Know that somebody is looking over your shoulder. Somebody's breathing down your neck. Somebody's watching you. Operate under the assumption that somebody's always surveilling you. That somebody's always watching you. And be smart about it. Be honest with your doctor. Be honest with the insurance company's doctor. And you'll be okay. If you're not honest, you're going to have a, a problem. The D-man. Is it usual once you reach MMI, the insurance company will send you for an IME a few months after reaching MMI, although you are in the settlement stage? Uh, is it usual if you're in the midst of settling and you're relatively close? I Usually insurance companies will not send you out for an IME. Sometimes it happens, I don't know if it's computer generated or if it's a person in a different department sees that it's been a while since an IME has been scheduled. We do see it sometimes. Uh, we've had cases where we work out a settlement and the next morning the client calls us up and say they just got a letter for an IME or a week later and we call them up and usually we can get it canceled because it's uh, unnecessary. So um, if the parties are not very close uh, in terms of their settlements, if, if they're not, it doesn't, if it doesn't look like a, an agreement is imminent, um, if there's an issue, if maybe there's still a medical issue, um, they might send you for an IME. So it does happen. It's not, I'm not going to say it never happens. Um, and again, sometimes they're doing it because they are suspicious of you and they think if they set up an IME, they could send the investigator there to keep an eye on you um, and catch you in the act. And, and, and so sometimes that's the reason why they set up IMEs. Uh, it's like I said before, surveilling somebody going into and out of an IME and what they do before and after that appointment uh, are huge because they're very proximal in time to the IME. It's right before and right after. And what you report at that IME is con could be contrasted with what you've done right before and right after. So surveillance surrounding IME appointments, uh, like our nurse friend, I want to give you the proper uh, nurse, legal nurse. Diego has said earlier, yes, surveillance in and around IME time uh, is, is a big one. Good question. If there's three months now, my employer didn't send me to any QM. And the next thing they are trying to do is send me to take a drug and alcohol test. I, again, with the drug and alcohol testing, I'm not very sure, my friend. Um, you, uh, If you have an attorney, I would speak to your attorney about those concerns. There's a lot of a lot more facts around your, your surrounding your case that I would need to know to, to give you some better uh, advice there. Mo Fox, cute dog. Hey, can my attorney request to keep my benefits coming after the doctor send me back to work? Well, which doctor is sending you back to work? Is it your doctor sending you back to work? Is it the insurance company doctor sending you back to work? It really depends who is recommending that you return to work. Are they recommending you return to work at full duty or at light duty? Again, an important distinction that we need to know about. If your doctor says that you're capable of returning to work at full duty and you choose not to for whatever reason, the insurance company has a very good argument to make to suspend your awards here in New York State. I don't know about other states. Um, if the insurance company doctor recommends that you return to work, that based upon his examination, you can go back to work, whether it's full duty or light duty, the insurance company has an argument, but they cannot generally suspend until you have a hearing. If, it, if the awards that you're being paid have been um, awarded by a judge, they cannot generally suspend you until a judge suspends those awards. Um, they can't do it unilaterally, we call it. They can't do it on their own. Um, so good question. What do we have here? Maurice, my last two visits with the insurance company doctor has not been pleasant. Well, <laughs> welcome to my world. I feel as though that their best interest is with the employer and not with me. You nailed it, Maurice. The insurance company is not there. That You're used to a doctor who's there to help you and a doctor's there to be on your side. Um, this is the one doctor that's not there to help you. He doesn't care. He is being paid by the insurance company to give his opinion his objective opinion about your condition. Uh, these are doctors that are hired by the insurance company to to to, to check up it, uh, on you and your condition. And yeah, they're not there to make sure that your best interests are in order. They're there for the insurance company. Uh, and the pleasantries of those visits are few and far between. Oftentimes an IME appointment, uh, you go there and there's 50 people in the waiting room. They pack in the doctor's day with 
I don't know how they find the time to see that many people in the course of the day and still be able to breathe and go to the bathroom. But, you know, it's not uncommon for you to walk into an IME appointment waiting room and have 30 people sitting there waiting to see the doctor in the course of a few short hours. Um, it's remarkable. And they move you through the process like uh, it's, it's like herding cattle. It's a horrible thing, but that's what they do. Can't avoid it. Wait, uh, Mo is going back to what he's talking about doing an FCE, functional capacity evaluation. Yeah, um, is it? I, I don't know if your case is a New York State case or not, uh, Mo. But um, <laughs> if uh, an FCE is a functional capacity evaluation, usually that comes in the tail end of your case when determining your uh, your permanent disability. And here is my friend Andre Green, big mean Andre Green. Facts: the insurance company doctor lies like a rug. You said it, my friend. <laughs> Andre, good, good one. Andre gets the runner-up. He's the he's the silver star of the day. Uh, Jose from earlier, uh, we're giving gold star status too. So everybody, uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, as always, we're here to help. Uh, I am Rex Sakovsky. 212-406-8989 is my telephone number. If anybody has any questions about workers' compensation, if you have questions about um, personal injury cases, social security disability. Uh, we have a couple of uh, labor and employment attorneys, some good, some terrible. I'm just joking. Um, but if you have any any related legal questions, please feel free to give me a call. We have a couple other questions coming in as well. Emmy, Emmy B, I'm a nurse with a traumatic foot injury. It's been almost a year and a half. Still recouping. They denied my light duty until I'm 100%. Lawyer suggested trying to negotiate a settlement with the insurance company. Well, that's pretty standard set of facts right there. There are a lot of employers out there. There's a lot of employment types that won't take you back unless you're 100%. Uh, nursing is something I can uh, understand why. They don't want you being less than 100% if you're taking care of other people who are hurt and you would be a liability to them. So they don't want you hopping around on one bad foot because you might cause more damage than good. Um, and they don't offer light duty because if they did, everyone who had any sort of an injury would be asking for light duty. And, you know, it does issues like that sometimes run into um, uh, ADA accommodation concerns where they have to sometimes give you an accommodation if you request it. And there are concerns there. Um, and again, that's a labor and employment uh, issue. And I could certainly refer everybody to uh, an attorney who handles that stuff. Uh, he's a super guy, very smart, knows the stuff. Uh, we deal with a couple different people who, who were able to help you with that. So any questions about ADA and accommodations, but generally speaking from a worker's compensation perspective, they don't have to take you back unless you're hundred percent because they need you at hundred percent. That's the job that you were hired for. That's the job that you do. Um, your lawyer suggested you try to negotiate a settlement with the insurance company. I mean, if you're if your injury is stable, if you're at maximum medical improvement, it might be time to do that. And then you question whether or not you're able to do that job anymore. Um, you need to have a, a sit down with your lawyer, uh, have a have a real heart to heart with him and go over the facts of your case and you know what your expectations are moving forward, because that's very important. And um, you know, come to a conclusion as to what the next steps, no pun intended, in your case um, would be. Very good question. Sorry about your traumatic foot injury. Team Smoke Shack Outdoors is back with a good one. Do you recommend filming your IME? Um, in New York State, you have to let them know if you're going to film the IME. There's a, when you get your IME, I don't have one here. When you get your IME appointment sheet, it's called an IME 5. It would say in the bottom left-hand corner, IME-5. That's the appointment letter that shows that you're, you're, uh, you're set to see the insurance company doctor. Um, they'll say on there whether or not the doctor intends on filming the IME. If you intend on filming the IME or recording it in any way, you need to let them know in advance. Um, do I recommend it? It's not a bad idea. I mean, it, it, it is a protection. Um, we have seen some uh, some fishy things pop up on, on video and audio recording from an IME. So if that's something that you choose to do, uh, certainly it, it can't hurt you. Um, so very good question. Mr. Team Smoke Shack. Sequoia is back with another question. If they gave me restrictions like don't pull five pounds, 
there's three months now. I didn't receive a medical assistant now. If they send me to the doctor, can they change my restrictions? I don't feel better. Uh, I'm not too, uh, I don't understand really what you're asking here. Um, it's been three months since you were given restrictions and you're not feeling better. You should certainly speak to your doctor about your restrictions, about your condition. Why aren't you feeling better after three months? You should, you should, you know, we're human beings. As time goes on, we heal. Uh, medical treatment is there to help us heal. We're supposed to get better over time. So if a few months have gone by and your restrictions haven't changed and you're still feeling bad, you're not feeling any improvement, I would absolutely speak to your doctor, make sure they know what your condition is and why maybe you're not um, getting the, the relief that you should otherwise be feeling. Again, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know that I don't know your injury, but I would certainly have a discussion with the doctor there. We all live the same life. Workers' comp won't give me a lump sum, and they froze my private lawsuit. The private suit is telling me they are waiting for the workers' comp suit, but they're not answering my lawyer's emails. And then he wants to know what happens next. I need a lot more information to answer that question. Um, when you have an accident and a workers' compensation case, when you get hurt on the job, you have workers' compensation. When somebody else, other than your employer or coworker or yourself, is responsible for your accident and your injury, oftentimes you could sue them. It's a third-party lawsuit. So um, this question is referring to the, the interplay between the workers' compensation claim and your third-party lawsuit. They both come from the same accident. You have now two legal matters that come out of the same accident. And the two of them do have, uh, they interact. There is some back and forth between the two. And uh, it sounds like we all live the same life as having some issues with the uh, insurance company and the attorneys. Um, you need to find out from your lawyer where the, where the roadblock is, who is not answering who, and what the next steps could be. Sometimes it's going back in front of the judge. Uh, sometimes it might just be if the adjuster is not answering your emails, ask to speak to their supervisor. Um, you can Karen them and ask for the supervisor. There's a lot of different ways of going about it, but you need to kind of figure out where that roadblock is so you can come up with an idea of how to get around it. I'm sorry you're having those problems. The mechanic, the machine, Inc. Marte. I have workers' comp in a third-party case since 2019. How long will this case last? I also have never received an offer yet. 2019, five years. It's your 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 case is getting ripe. Um, from a workers' comp perspective, your case your case is uh, is uh, an octogenarian. It's an old you, five years for a workers' comp case is, is getting up there in age. Five years for a personal injury case, not that old. Those cases take a while to develop and 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 either be settled or litigated. So, you know, again, going back to what I said before, there is an interplay between the two. There is there is uh, they're not entirely independent of one another, and sometimes one case is hanging in the balance based upon what's going to happen in the other case. So, like I said, for the last person, you need to speak to your lawyer, get an understanding of what the holdup is here and what you guys can do to move your case forward. Good question. Mo, last question. You can ask me anytime you want. Any questions you have for me, please. No last questions. Hey, last question. I'm in Mississippi. But are crushed leg injuries worth more? I had eight surgeries in court. MRSA, oof, horrible, horrible. That added six weeks onto my recovery, also the skin and bone graft. I don't know Mississippi law. I'm sorry. I can't answer that question. Um, a crushed leg injury in New York is worth the same as a laceration, as a fracture, as anything else, because it's not based upon the nature of the injury. It's based upon the nature of your permanent disability. If the MRSA adds to your overall level of permanent damage, then the value would go up. If MRSA is an infection that went away and there was no resulting residual side effects, then it wouldn't add to the value, presumably, in New York State. I don't know about Mississippi law. Um, but if, uh, if anybody, if you have any questions, I, I might be able to help you track down an attorney. If you don't have one, uh, we could do that for anywhere in the country. If anybody has any questions about anything, any workers' comp issues, any personal injury issues across the country, uh, we work with a very good network of attorneys. So we could always help out with any of those questions. Sorry about that. MRSA and a little crush injury, man. I hope, uh, you should get more time to hang out with that cute dog. Uh, hi, I did surgery and it's 20 months. How long can it, can it take to settle a case? In New York State, again, it depends on the injury, it depends on the surgery, it depends on your recovery, it depends on a lot of different factors, um, and it depends on the insurance company. You know, there are certain insurance companies that don't settle cases. They let the case run its course from beginning to end, and you know, however long that case takes in front of the judge is how long it takes. So there's no real set time frame. Um, we've spoken in the past about scheduled loss of use cases, uh, which are, are cases involving extremity injuries. 
those cases usually start to wrap up a year after your date of accident or your date of surgery if you have surgery but again those are just very uh generic uh guidelines that there, there's no hard and fast rule and 20 months is you know we have cases we have many cases that are well beyond 20 months so um <clears throat> talk to your lawyer get a good understanding about why your case is where it's taking this long and how it got to this point and what you could start doing to wrap it up Mr. Smoke Shack, man, you guys, I almost wrapped up before, and now we're getting bombarded with fantastic questions. Could you please give some advice on not accepting a Section 32 agreement after you've reached maximum medical improvement and you've been medically terminated? Medically terminated, will comp have to pay you? I, I'm a little unclear on your question. Um, not accepting a Section 32 agreement after you've reached maximum medical improvement. So your employer is not taking you back because your injuries are so severe that you can't do your old job and they want you back at, at light uh, total 100% clearance or pretty close to it. And they let you go from your job and you want to know about settling your case with a workers, uh, uh, section 32 settlement. I, there are a lot more facts I would need to know about your particular case to give you an answer to that question. Um, but generally speaking, you know, if you can't return to your job because of your injury, you can't return to your job. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are totally disabled. Uh, the example I always give, if you're a big, strong construction worker, you know, you might have a relatively minor injury. You might have a herniated disc in your back, which is something that a guy who just sits at a desk, a nerd like me that types all day, you know, a herniated disc might not affect them as much as a big, strong construction worker. So a herniated disc that gives them a little bit of pain might keep that construction worker from ever going back to their job. They might be medically terminated, like you're saying. But they might only have a 25 or 30 or 35 percent permanent disability because of that injury. But it doesn't take much to 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 make a construction worker or, a, you know, those types of strenuous jobs uh, totally disabled. So, you know, it, it's hard to answer those questions. Certainly have a discussion with your attorney, though. Uh, moving on here, let's see if there's some other questions here. The industrial clinic doctors have requested epidurals and surgery, but the insurance denied it. The doctor released me to modify duty because he can't do anything else and declared me MMI. Now what? Um, again, I can only speak to how this works in New York State. Uh, epidurals, surgery, things like that. Uh, under New York State law, we have a set of medical treatment guidelines, and they're guidelines that essentially tell the doctor how to treat any particular type of injury. And there are certain treatments and surgery that fall within the guidelines. And if the doctor follows the progression of medical treatment that's set forth in the guidelines, if it's surgery time and they've done everything else, they can go ahead and do surgery. But outside the guidelines, um, you know, or if it's something that's not otherwise addressed in the guidelines, the doctor has to get permission, has to get authorization for treatment. And in New York State, we have a very specific and strict authorization process. And unfortunately for, for me, as much as I like to help my clients, the board, workers' compensation board, has taken us out of that equation. They don't let us get involved like we used to. The doctors have to put requests in through a medical portal, which is provided by the board. It's on the, the workers' compensation board website, and they have to follow the instructions, and they have to uh, run through this procedure, and there's three different levels of review, and it's, it's a very convoluted process. But here in New York State, the doctors must follow that process to the end in their attempts to get treatment or surgery authorized and only at the, the tail end of things when there's no other options can we get someone involved to try to push treatment forward um, if your doctor thinks you need epidurals and you need surgery he should and again i don't know if you're in new york state or not but he should follow those that process to the end and try to get you what you need to get you better that's really the goal here very good question okay let's see what else we got here Divine creations. I had a knee injury at work. Six months later, I had a surgery. The surgery didn't fix anything. The doctor says I won't be able to run or do my old job 100%. Currently doing physical therapy. Sorry to hear that. Um, keep going with your treatment. Again, I'm only, I can only talk about a New York State case. Keep going with your treatment. Get to that point of MMI. Hopefully, it gets you at or close to your, your formal level 
before your accident. And if there is any residual deficit or damage, you can get a good schedule loss award here in New York State with a knee injury. Uh, ho we're hoping that you heal up, you get better, and you're able to move on. Uh, but it's tough to hear. Taisha, hi, Rex. Hi. I'm in NYC. All parties, insurance and judge, agree on multiple body part ratings. Nothing has happened for months now. What should be happening at this point? Um, hard to say. To say all parties agree on multiple body part ratings, uh, I need to know what the sites of injury are. I need to know what we're specifically talking about here. Um, do they agree that you have reached a level of permanent disability and they disagree on what your level of disability is? Oftentimes, you know, we get a lot of calls from clients asking, what's going on with my case? We're in the permanency stage. I haven't heard anything in a few months. Well, it's because all the doctors agree, both your doctor and the insurance company doctor agree, you have a permanent injury. They disagree on the level of that permanent disability. And we are in the deposition stage. And depositions can be 60, 75, 90, 120 days, sometimes even longer. Um, the judge gives us to depose all the doctors and get all their opinions out, ask them all the questions we need to ask them. So sometimes it feels like things are not happening, and they are. We're doing depositions, and there's not much to report until we do all the depositions and we, we summarize all of our arguments in the doctor's uh, reports. So they, you could be at that stage. Uh, if you have an attorney, call your attorney, uh, Taisha. I don't know if it's Taisha or Taisha. Um, call your attorney. Get a, get, get a status update. Uh, if you don't have an attorney and you want me to help you out, please give me a call, you or anybody else, 212. 406-8989. Happy to help. And you guys are on it with the questions today. I love it. I had a hearing. Marlon Cardoza. I had a hearing. Good friend of mine went to Cardoza Law School. Um, I had a hearing and was awarded retroactive pay. Ten days passed and I haven't received all of them. Do my lawyers have to request a hearing for the awards that weren't paid? Great question. Late payment penalties. Yes. Um, wait a little longer. Make sure they really are late so you can really use it against them. But yes, if you are owed uh, an award of compensation, they have a, a set time to pay. I believe it's 10 days from the date of the notice of decision. Um, an installment of compensation. So if you're getting weekly installments, they have 20 days um, before it's deemed late. So yes, if your payments are late, talk to your lawyer. Tell your lawyer to request a hearing. Go after a late payment penalty. If they owe you retroactive uh, awards, like you're saying here, and they haven't paid you in time, we have a case like this brewing right now. 20% um, of the late, of, of the unpaid amount is the penalty. So if they owe you $1,000 and it's late, you're going to get a check for 200 bucks. 20%. Very nice. BJ go crazy. Fell from a railroad car at my job. Told the supervisor that I fell. Supervisor never told the manager about my job. My injury job terminated me. Can I file for wrongful termination? That's a labor and employment question, and that might be a federal question. A lot of railroad employee cases, injuries, things like that are federal, not state. Um, you might want to speak to a, uh, a federal attorney. Um, if you ha haven't retained anybody, you have any questions, give me a call. I might be able to get you set up. Uh, wrongful termination. Well, you'd have to speak to somebody. I, I don't want to give you the wrong information. 212-406-8989. We all live the same life. The adjuster is not answering the emails, so my lawyer said he will try to go in front of the judge. The last time I was in front of the judge, my MMI was calculated. What can a judge do? So, Mr. Uh, this gentleman, we've been having this discussion earlier, um, where he has a comp and a third party, and there, 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 there seems to be a, a, a pause or a delay in this case. What can the judge do? The judge can light a fire. If somebody's not doing their job, if they're acting in bad faith, if they're not answering emails, judges want people want parties to work out their cases. So. Uh, a judge might be able to light a fire and move that case forward. The private suit has been done for a year now, so it's the comp carrier. It's workers comp. The, let the judge get involved and, uh, and give them a shove. That's what you need to do. Do you know a good attorney to get P. Diddy out of trouble? Hello. Man, you need to be a great lawyer for that. You need to be even better than me, P. Diddy. Oh, Lord. That's funny stuff right there. That's not actually. It's terrible. <laughs> I'm 75, Chris Ashley. Chris was asking me some good questions last week. Thanks. Welcome back. I'm 75% disabled before surgery. Now, five weeks after surgery, what usually follows at this point? Um, well, in New York State, when you have a causally related, authorized, permissible, whatever surgery, if your surgery is due to that accident and those injuries, you are deemed by law, uh, generally speaking, to be totally disabled following your surgery. And that total disability generally, again, I'm speaking in generalities, will stick with you 
for um, a, a, an extended period of time until the insurance company has you examined usually or until your doctor offers that you're less than 100%. So usually what happens is you have your surgery, your total, the insurance company usually picks up your benefits at the total rate. If they don't, the attorney should be requesting a hearing and um, getting your benefits up to total. And that total will carry for a while. And usually six, seven, eight, ten 10 weeks after that surgery, the insurance company is going to send you out to see the IME doctor. And be careful because there could be surveillance, if anybody remembers from a half an hour ago what we were discussing. But they'll send you out to see their doctor, and their doctor is going to say that maybe you're not totally disabled anymore. Maybe you're 75% disabled or 50 or 25% disabled. And then they're going to try to cut your benefits down. That's generally what happens. So just be on the lookout for an IME notice in the mail at that point in time. Um, and speak to your doctors. Make sure everything is documented as to your, your healing process and how you're doing post-surgery. Um, surgeries are good. They're there to help you. I'm glad you're getting your surgery. That means you're on the you're on the good side of your case. You're on the upside of the case. You're on the getting better side of your case, and that's what I like to hear. So good job, Chris. Uh, and for all you out there, if anybody found any of these questions in this video helpful, please hit the like button, subscribe. Uh, I love seeing my numbers go up. It makes me feel good, like I'm helping people. So you guys had great questions today. Um, and to see more of these videos, again, smash the like button. That's what people say. Smash the like button uh, and subscribe. My name is Rex Sikofsky, workers' compensation attorney in New York State. Please, any questions, feel free to call 212-406-8989. Uh, if there's any questions I didn't get to this week, I'm sorry. I couldn't get to all of them. There were so many good questions. Uh, they're still coming in. Save them for next week. I'm going to do my best to be here uh, next week. Next week is an off week. Uh, a very good friend is getting married, and I'm going to mm, – maybe we could squeeze uh, – no, I'm going to be away. Sorry. Um, but the following week, put on your calendars. April 10th, um, I will be here. We'll, we'll have another hot topic. You know me. I'm always good for hot topics in the workers' comp world. We get the, the good, juicy workers' comp stuff. Um, but any questions between now and then, 212 406 8989. Uh, thank you, everybody, and have yourselves a wonderful day. Be safe, be careful out there. Bye bye.